Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan here in Marinucci. I'm Anthony Rowley. I'm a former president of the club, and uh, I'll be acting as moderator today. Um, this is the latest in what we call, <coughs> excuse me, our deep dive events in which we invite experts, expert panelists to uh, address the club on issues of current interest. And I think we'd all agree that little could be of greater current interest to us today than the COVID-19 pandemic um, and the way it's running rampant here in Tokyo and in Japan as a whole. Um, we're very fortunate, and I mean that very sincerely, and grateful to have two eminent medical experts with us today to address these issues, Dr. Kiyoshi Kurakawa and Dr. Kenji Shibuya. Both are joining us online, and let me extend a very warm and sincere welcome to both of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules and obviously very difficult time like this. Um, Dr. Kurokawa will speak first, and he'll offer a general overview of the situation and comment on failures mm -hmm. of governance uh, that have exacerbated the problem. Dr. Shibuya will then focus on a number of topical issues that illustrate these points. In particular, why was the vaccine rollout so delayed in Japan, why was testing so low, and why is the health system so fragile? So let me give you a, a, a brief background on our two speakers. Dr. Kurokawa graduated from the University of Tokyo School of Medicine. He spent 15 years in the United States from 1969 to 1984, where he was professor of medicine at UCLA, or the University of California, Los Angeles. He was formerly dean of Tokai University Medical School, president of the Science Council of Japan, and science advisor to the Prime Minister of Japan. Dr. Kurokawa, of course, is also well known to many of us from the fact that he chaired the uh, Fukushima Nuclear Accident Independent Investigation Commission by the National Diet of Japan in 2011. He's currently vice chair of the World Dementia Council, established by the G8, which is now the G7, um, London Dementia Summit in 2013. And he's also chair of the COVID-19 AI Advisory Board appointed by Health Minister Nishimura in July last year. Okay, Dr. Shibuya also graduated in medicine from the University of Tokyo, and he earned a doctorate degree in international health economics at Harvard. Uh, he's currently director of the SOMA COVID Vaccination Medical Center in SOMA City in Fukushima. Dr. Shibuya was previously professor and director of the Institute, University Institute for Population Health at King's College in London. And before joining King's, he was professor and chair of the Department of Global Health at the University of Tokyo. He's been an advisor to both central and local governments, and most recently, he was special advisor to the Director General of the World Health Organization, WHO, and a member of the um, Scientific Advisory Committee of Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, a pandemic vaccine fund which invests in COVID-19 vaccines. He spearheaded the future strategic directions of the Japanese global health policy agenda at the Hokkaido Tokyo G8 Summit in 2008, on health system strengthening and the Issei Shima G7 summit in 2016 on global health security. So let me now hand over to our, the first of our speakers. But before I do that, let me remind you, if you have a mobile phone, please switch it off or put it on manner mode as a courtesy to uh, our guests. So Dr. Kurokawa, if you would go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you for inviting me again to this uh, session, very important. Now, this uh, corona uh, pandemic is once in a century kind of a pandemic, started in Wuhan, China. So I was really following this, so what, uh, what's happening there through in the, in, because of internet. We can see how they do, and they submitted many papers in English, and I think they seem to done a great job at that time. But I, but I expected, Next site it may come would be either from Korean Peninsula or Japan. And I think that could be easily quarantined if somebody flying in from that area. But we found out uh, Diamond Princess, what was a completely surprise for us. More than 2000 people on the, on the vessel 
And that was the beginning of this corona in Japan. So the response, earlier response by the government may be a bit uh, uh, unexpected thing, uh, but that's what it is. And then I started uh, suggesting the government, now this become pandemic. Now this is the time of internet. So you can follow each country, how they respond to this pandemic, like Sweden and UK and this and that. And you could follow and learn and sharing the response or national response in this pandemic. And also they created their own policy, but I think at the end of the day, what was the mortality rate of each country is one of the sort of reference. And I like to show you because I have no, not much idea what, what are the reasons of these differences. And I'd like to have your sort of wisdom and also make comments from uh, Dr. Shibuya. Uh, I'd like to show you the series of slides with the cause of this of different countries over the last year and a half. This is the age August of this year, and this is the USA. You know, the cause of this, number one is Corona, which you might have not expected, but this is a reality. And that was the reason the American re response, particularly from New York was a very serious one. Next slide. This is, uh, this is another one, the UK, again, Corona. This by Corona is number two or number one over last year and a half. This is August, right? Next one. Then this one is France. Again, Corona is a number one cause of this over the last more than a year and a half. That is uh, France. And next slide. And uh, what happened? Oh, no, no, no. This is the last one. Really? Ah, OK, yeah. whatever you like. You, if you have some, uh, this is uh, another country. India, this is India, yeah. Right, and this is not. So like remarkably, UK and US and France, this is the top of the cause of this over last year and a half. Mm -hmm. And this is India. Although India rapid, uh, rapid corona in a few months ago, but as a cause of this, it's still around number 10. Mm -hmm. And next one, because this is skipping many. And China, I think this is very small. This is the initial corona completely contained, but at least this is too small to believe this is the case, but I'm not so sure. That may be an interpret interpretation, could be a bit different. Next slide. And this is Indonesia, and this is a number four. And next one. And this is Australia, very few. Next slide. Sweden, I think this is the initial Sweden policy was science advisor and then J J uh, government made a decision. And so they are just working as usual. And then this was cause of this. So they changing this thing and next slide. And this is Norway. It is a bit different from Sweden. So we, uh, we have to think about why. Next slide. And, uh, you're skipping many. Uh, how about Japan and Korea? And Korea, do we have? Yes. Yeah. yeah, this is Japan, which is also, I think this is August, which is still reasonably low. Next one. Mm. Yeah. And Korea is still low. Next slide. Thailand, not so bad. Next one. And Vietnam, not so bad. Next one. Malaysia, next one. India. Okay, so you saw the quite different, remarkable difference. And I have no, not much idea what are the major reasons of difference. UK and the US and France, Corona was number one cause of death over last year, year and a half. But Australia was very low. And Vietnam, and I think I, I like to share this with you. And I leave this slide because this their data is quite available. And go back to the last one. And this is a source of data. I, I checked uh, some of the numbers, which we predicted like Japanese cause of this and this. Uh, it seems to be reasonably trans, trustworthy. So that what are the differences of this one? 
And what was the response in Japan compared to other countries, you know, vaccine and other issues? So I think I'm posing more questions than answers to you to share, like some input from you. And I guess one of the most notable response earlier was uh, one of your friends, Jeff Kingston, wrote an article in Washington Post and saying, Japanese response to corona pandemic seems to be the lack of certain things, which is quite common to the Fukushima nuclear accident. So I'd like to get into why this is, because this year was a 10th year of Fukushima disaster, and Japanese government response was a bit of uh, in error, but just Jeff Kingston pointed out somehow keyword in response to Fukushima and corona in Japan quite similar keywords is has been appearing. So I was quite impressed by his uh, Washington Post article, which is, huh? that was Japanese response, but Japan was fortunate. This is not the top of cause of death. So not much uh, fiasco in Japan. So I'm arguing whether Japanese uh, response was successful, but that's, this was really due to Japanese policy or such a sort of incidence of Japan and Korea seems to be quite resilient. And factors are not known. So I'd like to have your input on this issue. That is my sort of comment uh, to initiate this session. All right, thank you. Some very intriguing points, especially the comparison between Fukushima and the COVID incident. Uh, Dr. Shibuya, would you like to make your presentation, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I saw Kuroka Sensei will give us a more, you know, uh, it was very interesting to see his chart. And um, my initial response is it's extremely difficult to really estimate the death from COVID accurately because A, the testing capacity dif is right. widely different. And also, mm -hmm. uh, there are differences in terms of uh, you know, classification cause of death. For example, in UK, Alzheimer is number one cause of death, which is common in more yeah. countries. But in Japan, it's really underestimated. So, yeah, a bunch of mixture. But uh, overall, a East Asia and the Asian Pacific countries are doing well initially because of their zero COVID approach, except J Japan or other few countries, China, Taiwan, New Zealand, Australia, uh, basically they were adopting the zero COVID, meaning not eradication, but elimination of mm -hmm. COVID. Right. So I think that was the initial success, mm -hmm. but these days I think it's changing. So. We can discuss it later, but let me just focus on my presentation first. Yes. She was so, saying, so I, yeah. I apologize, but we're getting slight distortion, I think, on your microphone. Could okay. You, Is um, it, can you speak? hear me now? Hello? All right. Thank yeah? you. Is it okay? All right. Yes, that's better, I think. Okay. So let me just introduce myself. Um, I'm currently. Oh, no, no, you faded now. Sorry. <laughs> uh, let me change my microphone. Can you hear me now? All right. That's better. Yeah? yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, currently I'm a director of Soma COVID vaccine center in Fukushima where you know, there was a you know, earthquake, tsunami and nuclear accident. Since 2011, I have been helping them. So I was asked by mayor to help them out in terms of mass vaccination. Previously, I was the, yeah, doing a bunch of housekeeping, both in Japan and the UK. And personally, I'm a big fan of all things inspiring, excellent, and differentiated, and all to the body. So uh, i just give you just three things in 10 minutes. Uh, so no. I, I'll just uh, uh, rephrase the three basic approaches to controlling infection and the Japan model to COVID response and a few examples of a kind of government of failure, uh, which mm -hmm. Koko Sensei is very good at talking. So this is you know, his staff uh, from Fukushima. And you know, his, I think he wrote in preface that uh, its fundamental cause is uh, to be found <laughs> in 
ingrained convention of Japanese culture. So our reflexive obedience, our reluctance to question authority, our devotion to sticking with the program or sticking with the status quo, our groupism, collective um, thinking, and our insularity. So that's his, that was his message. But I, uh, as he just mentioned, uh, we see the similar kind of uh, you know, phenomenon in our response to COVID. So um, let me go back to just three basic approaches to infection control. There are only three ways to control infection. One mm -hmm. is to disrupt the route of the transmission, right? So wearing right. masks, avoiding three Cs, washing hands, taking social distance. And the extreme way is a lockdown, just you know, you know, separate you from me. So that's one way. But basically Japan has been relying on these tactics and asking people to do that. And Japanese people did very well uh, you know, compared to other countries, I think. Second is to identify and remove the source of infection. So that is basically expanding testing. And the third mm -hmm. is to increase host immunity is vaccination. So basically what Japan has done was asking people voluntarily to take a distance from others or wear a mask about three Cs. Right. Just taking one strategy one and not focusing too much on the second, the testing. And now, you know, they are trying to ramping up the uh, vaccination partly because of the Olympics, but uh, yeah. So still, I think this framework, the basic approach to COVID in Japan is primarily based on the idea to disrupt the route of transmission by asking the general public to behave properly. Mm. And if we go back a year and a half ago, in Nikkei, I think uh, Dr. Ami Wakitsan and Dr. Professor Stani talks about what they are going to do. And Ostani mentioned that lockdown is a 19th century strategy. So they talked about the, the situation in Wuhan and China and how they, they tried to manage initially by a strict uh, draconian measure, including lockdown. But they were criticizing that approach by saying that lockdown is a 19th century strategy. And there should be an alternative approach to control infections through behavioral changes among the general public. I see there is already their principal idea to rely on people's behavior changes to mm. tackle this mm. pandemic. But after a year and a half, now Dr. Ami is saying that we should legislate lockdown because um, the current state of emergency is no longer effective. Mm. I see mm. there seems to be a huge problem here because over one and a half year, what was the progress? What is the scientific basis? What mm. is the, their basic tactics to tackle this pandemic? Mm. Initially, they criticized lockdown, but they are saying, oh, there's nothing we could do more. So we should go for lockdown. I, I simply don't understand this kind of logic because yeah. as Dr. Kroka mentioned, globally every day or every minute, we see a bunch of papers and information circulating and there is, uh, there is uh, you know, huge, huge progress mm -hmm. for us to understand the infection dynamics and also how to control COVID because the risk is not universe and the mm -hmm. risk is accumulated mm -hmm. to certain areas. And we now understand that the major route of transmission is asymptomatic and mm -hmm. airborne, airborne transmission. Right. So, but still they are talking about the lockdown after one and a half years. So here mm -hmm. I see there is a huge problem. So I uh, focus for, on- Forgive me, but could you speak just a bit louder, please, if you don't mind? Yeah, okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. All right. Oh, okay. So uh, let me just uh, touch upon three examples, uh, testing right. and vaccination and the fragile health system. So in terms of PCR, so from the initial uh, stage, 
the expert and the government, particularly the Ministry of Health, employed the so-called cluster control approach, because uh, as just Professor Stan right. mentioned mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. he th they think that uh, you know. Yeah, we don't have to find out all cases to tackle COVID, which is true because we cannot do that. Uh, but he is saying that we can control it by identifying clusters of infected people. Mm -hmm. So therefore they focus the, the, to identify a symptomatic patient, relatively severely symptomatic patient and check the cross contact and then they assume that uh, you know mm -hmm. infection will go away, which wasn't, which didn't. So, but also he was saying that Japan is managing the current transmission at the time by restricting access to PCR testing. And he went over saying that um, if we allow more access to PCR for mild cases, uh, the medical system will collapse. So from the beginning, I was very critical about this because I, we knew that yeah. there was asymptomatic right. transmission from the data from the Diamond Princess and, and the airborne mm -hmm. transmission as well. But they didn't use that data to you know, really rethink about their strategy based on the clusters. And from here, Mm. And this is the message from the expert, warranty of expert, so-called. So they did a campaign that, you know, those who have a symptom to stay at home and at least for four days. And if you have a fever over 37.5 after four days, you get tested. So this mindset really haunted even now. Mm -hmm. So, and surprisingly, they deleted <laughs> this website <laughs> without any reasons. But uh, obviously, this really haunted the testing strategy here in Japan. So, and last year, I think last, around last October, because of the criticism of lack of access to testing, notably from Prime Minister Abe, and they changed the testing strategy. And in, in the presentation by the expert panel, so they questioned whether we should test asymptomatic cases with a low prior probability. Prior probability mean, meaning the probability, the extent of a community transmission. So they classify the testing strategy in three ways. So testing symptomatic cases, testing asymptomatic cases with a high prior probability of infection, like um, epicenter in Tokyo right now. The third is testing asymptomatic cases with a low prior probability of infection. So relatively uh, low prior pro probability of infection like um, you know, Fukushima two months ago, uh, in Soma now, we have very few infections. But the problem of this approach is uh, that um, they stick with the idea of prior probability, which we don't know most of the time. Mm -hmm. So, and surprisingly, last May, not, not last, uh, May 2020, right after they lifted the lockdown, the first lockdown, not lockdown, state of emergency declaration, mm -hmm. the Ministry of Health lobbied in Nagata Cho by circulating this table. Um, to say to the policymakers that you know we shouldn't expand PCR testing, and what they shown it's in Japanese, but I can explain that um, they used a very strange figure uh, as the to benchmark the accuracy of PCR testing. So sensitivity of seventy percent, specificity of 99 percent, and sensitivity is basically um, you know. The, the probability of testing uh, those who are actually positive to get test positive. Specificity is the opposite. But if you know the principle of PCR, PCR is basically you know replicating the genome gene, so it cannot be. Uh, it can. It, this basically specificity is mostly hundred percent. So for those who do. Uh, bioengineering, basic laboratory work, 
uh, we know that the specificity cannot be 99% or even 99.9%. So this is the very, very strange uh, figure. And they start to say, if we test more, we have a more false positive patient. Uh, and this is the violation of human rights or something. Very strange logic. So you, they use, so yeah, but we have to admit that there is a contamination of the specimen. If that's the case, there could be a, a situation where specificity is less than 100%. But the issue is different because they are mixing up the two test accuracy of PCR and also quality control issue. So I don't know they did it intentionally or unintentionally, but this is scientifically flawed. So they mixing up the accuracy of PCR testing and its quality control agenda, but also fundamentally, they are mixing up clinical diagnosis and the infection control issue. Because for those who are working in a clinical setting, now using prior probability is very important because it's a clinical diagnosis. But even, even there are many doctors, I was very surprised that doctors, clinicians are strongly opposing to PCR. But now I understand that because they are sticking with the idea of clinical diagnosis. For the clinical diagnosis, you do some basic checkup. And if it, there is, it seems to be a high prior probability of getting infected, you, you, you ask the patient to get tested. That's normal. But uh, for the infection control, uh, we, don't, we don't care much about whether, the, actually we do, but uh, the issue is whether this person in front of you will transmit the disease or not. It's not the issue about whether there is a virus in, in his or her body or not, right? So when we shifted the idea from clinical diagnosis to infection control, the issue about sensitivity or specificity is gone. It's totally nonsense because a PCR is a gold standard to diagnose that there is a virus in your body. But what they are talking about PCR sensitivity specificity is that so what's the gold standard when you use a PCR to, uh, to compare to what? It's PCR. So they are comparing PCR accuracy with PCR as a gold standard. So it's totally nonsense to use sensitivity specificity to criticize the PCR testing accuracy. So this is really scientific fraud approach. And also they obviously ignore the importance of asymptomatic and the airborne transmission. So I spoke to Yoko Kurasan, a former president of JMA, yeah. and mm -hmm. also uh, Ryozo Nagai, um, yeah. who was the president of the Jichi Medical School and who is a colleague of Dr. Krokawa in right. his AI you know, machinery right. Right. Uh, committee. And they are also very worried about this approach. And they, you know, all the scientists quickly understand that this is just rubbish. So uh, Yoko Kurasa asked us to set up the Japan Medical Association Task Force. And right. so they are also very concerned about expert panel of the Ministry of Health front. So <laughs> JMA set up its independent expert panel. It's like... Uh, scientific advisory group for epidemics in UK versus independent SAGE. So uh, that we, we wanted to be an independent view on the scientific agenda to tackle COVID. So the, this PCR testing task force um, uh, recommended that PCR is a social infrastructure and PCR should be implemented regardless of prior probability to control infection and maintain the economy not for clinical diagnosis. So that was clear, but uh, still there seems to be confusion about the PCR testing and mm -hmm. the kind of climate uh, on the ministry side or expert panel or the ministry, they are still very hesitant to go for massive testing. Second is the vaccine rollout issue, why it was delayed. You know, <clears throat> um, right now, Japan is wrapping up the vaccine mm -hmm. coverage very quickly, which is good. So Israel started very early, followed by the United States. 
these two countries are kind of stagnated around 50%, 60%. And Singapore and Canada are catching up very quickly. Singapore is now around the vaccine coverage is around 78% of the whole population. And Asian countries started late, thanks to the initial success, um, but because of the Delta, uh, you can see Thailand and Vietnam are suffering uh, the Delta um, yeah, epidemic right now, but they are also ramping up. New Zealand, um, you know, famous for its zero COVID approach, zero tolerance to COVID and strict border control, massive testing was very successful, but they are also ramping up the vaccination. Japan is doing well, after um, Prime Minister Suga uh, really pushed the, the Ministry of Health and also mm. Kono, you know, knack the ministry to do it more um, aggressively, which is very good. So I really admire the current administ administration on this agenda because without their push, uh, we couldn't have achieved this uh, you know, rate of expansion. Although their primary motivation was to hold the Olympics, but regardless of the political motivation, I think it was a good thing. But still, New Japan's uh, vaccine coverage, I mean, the fully vaccinated population is around 45%, not that enough uh, to tackle COVID. So there's, there are a few possible reasons behind the delayed rollout. So going back to this, if we could have started at the time when the UK or the United States started last December or January, I think the Olympics could have been held more safely or in a more, with, um, I think, spectators with massive testing. So if we could, Japan could have done the area rollout of vaccination and implemented mass, back, mass testing, I think the Olympics could have a totally different view um, you know, situation. Um, then there were some reasons. One is historical. And so there was a series of lawsuits in the 1980s and 1990s on the vaccine advocacy event. So policymakers, particularly bureaucrats, tend to be very, very risk averse. So they always request the industry to do a bridging trial, meaning very small clinical trials with the Japanese population. Um, usually 160 to 200 sample which doesn't mean any scientific um, merit, but just just um, process to show that the vaccine uh, administered to the Japanese population and uh, there was some sort of clinical trial. <laughs> and obviously high vaccination hesitancy because of this, so notably uh, HPV vaccination. Second is structural. Uh, TMO Japanese Health Ministry advisors, including myself, and Dr. Omi issued a warning in 2016 when Shiozaki was a health minister. And we said the Japan vaccine industry, Japanese vaccine industry was seriously uncompetitive and public awareness about vaccine safety was low, uh, high hesitancy, and the country faced serious risk if a pandemic broke out. Uh, we are not pro uh, prophet, but uh, <laughs> the issues we raised there were happening right now. And so they didn't do anything on this except a few. Uh, so, but the issue is not something new. Uh, it has been well known among the policymakers. And finally political uh, or some cultural. So Japan's relative success in an early phase uh, means that uh, primarily driven by people's effort um, you know, but uh, it is uh, called Japan model by the policy makers, means that uh, urgent rollout of vaccines was less of a priority. Mm -hmm. So, you know, HPG vaccine issue is still pending, pending. and the <laughs> recently Minister of Health Minister, right before he's stepping down next week, there seems to be a cabinet reshuffle. He said, we are going to consider to regime active recommendation on HP vaccination. I don't understand these terms, active recommendations. <laughs> but uh, when they say consider means they just delay the process, right? Mm. So in a bureaucratic term, consideration is basically delaying the process. 
So there is no date yet announced for the vaccine community for approval, nor no plans for resuming vaccination. So this is total rubbish. HPV vaccination is just, the coverage is just nearly zero right now. So this is really another scandal in terms of the vaccination. Mm. Uh, so this is the uh, TASCO report in October 2016. Mm. Uh, basically, I wrote it uh, with the support from the, some of the uh, advisors. Uh, so key issues about vaccination was yeah, we need to think the vaccination as a national security agenda, not just a public health matter. And Japanese industry is highly protected and subsidized, heavily subsidized, and lacking scale and also global competitiveness. Competitiveness, mm -hmm. something yeah. very similar to the financial sector in 1990s. So many small to medium scale uh, farmers and, uh, and also vaccine companies uh, for five, and they are heavily subsidized and protected. And on the government front, unclear mid to long-term national strategies. So we recommended that, uh, you know, obviously evidence-based vaccine policy and strategies and transform Japanese vaccine industry and the market in a modernized way as done for the finance, financial sector in 1990s and also harmonize regulatory approval process globally. And finally, contribute to global health, which is happening because uh, we ask, we has try to establish the CEPI, which is vaccine fund, mm -hmm. and uh, invest in Moderna, Oxford, and j and and many other COVID vaccines from the early phase. Mm -hmm. And we also finally recommended to develop domestic capacity to produce pandemic vaccines and vaccines of public health relevance by enhancing partnerships. But um, they didn't do this. So that's why, that's the reason why we are mm -hmm. now. And in terms of ramping up vaccination, I'm helping Soma. We 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 have already done, the, <laughs> right? Uh, not me because the mayor and the <laughs> the, the public and the medical association, local medical association support. We have a uh, 86, 87 percent coverage of the whole uh, for those over age 12, to, uh, fully vaccinated, and uh, you know. We, uh, Every week I was, I'm asked to be on TV and to show why Soma was so successful. But as you know, Soma was well prepared because they right. went through the crisis, disaster, nuclear accident, and the linkage, the collaboration between the city, uh, mm. people, medical yeah. association, the general public mm. is just enormous. And also the thanks to leadership. And right. we, we did a bunch of you know tweaking in terms of to enhance user experience and user interface so that the people are convinced that they should get vaccinated. And finally, uh, also through <laughs> SOMA, we are advocating alternative approaches to wider access among younger population. So one way is to, because there are many municipalities, uh, they set aside uh, you know, two set of vaccine, first dose, second dose, uh, with three week interval. And then they started to send out, the, sending out the coupons to the people. Mm -hmm. But we are saying, that if you have the second dose in your hand, why don't you just use that to the younger people and wait for the next uh, you know, lot to come? And it, but they are very afraid that uh, you know, there is a guideline of a three week interval. Uh, if we break the rule, you know, the immunity may not be developed. No, 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 there is a clear scientific evidence. If we extend the interval before the second dose from three weeks to six weeks or even eight to 12 weeks, the immunity reaction, immune reaction will be much more higher. And the second day, there's a strategy called so-called a mix and a match. So first dose with AstraZeneca followed by Pfizer, we have a two or three times higher mm -hmm. antibody titer. And the third day, half a standard dose for booster shot. And in fact, Moderna, uh, has just asked the FDA yesterday. Asked the FDA yesterday 
to utilize this strategy for the, the third dose, i.e. booster shot. So, so in SOMA, uh, we have been arguing this and advocating to the, the mayor of the SOMA is the president of the you know, mayor association. And we are using that route to influence the cabinet because if, you know, this COVID situation clearly uh, told us that the, gov the national government cannot do much, or even they try to do that, that they cannot protect us. Instead, each municipality or each industry, each company should protect their people by themselves. So I think the focus of uh, you know, lobbying or influence the policy would be much more efficient if we go the <laughs> bottom-up approach. That's the tactics which I am taking because when I was <laughs> advisor to Minister Shiozaki, when he was the health minister uh, five years ago, I did everything I could to influence from the national level, but it didn't work out not much except a few. And of course, Shiozaki was very, very aggressive to change the situation. So it was quite useful, but now, if you see the situation in the national government, just paralyzed, but on the ground at the municipality level, um, you know, people are so working extremely hard and trying to make things better. Mm. That was my impression. But finally, in terms of the vaccination, I don't think there is, it is possible to achieve the herd immunity. And uh, so the reasons are fivefold. The vaccine may not prevent transmission, obviously, because of Delta. The breakthrough, so called breakthrough infection, is pretty much common. And globally, vaccine rollout is not even. And more variants coming out. And the, because of the high transmissibility, herd immunity threshold is getting higher. And obviously, immunity might not last forever and vaccine might change human behavior. So before vaccination, after vaccination, I was thinking that after vaccination, the zero COVID approach may not be applicable and the with COVID approach it would be rational. But now I think that we may need to continue to have, impose some restriction in terms of at least on mask wearing and right. ventilation. <laughs> Finally, uh, I should be quick. Uh, why Japanese health system is so fragile? Uh, this is a nice uh, figure uh, in, in the Bloomberg. And obviously we have more beds than other countries, um, but uh, less physicians. And in terms of hospital, uh, the more, most of the hospital, uh, you know, small to medium scale private facilities. And that was well, well, known, well known again as in the case of vaccine industry. And in fact, I was chairing the Physician Work Study Form Committee of the ministry, and we pointed out uh, many issues. So basically, Japanese health system is very, very, has a very low productivity as in other sectors. So high volume, but low value added services, very fragmented. Uh, or right. mostly run by mm -hmm. small to medium sized private facilities. And that means each facility needs a doctor and they have to work over time and tirelessly, particularly at the University Hospital and Tertiary Hospital, the young doctors are working over time you know, quite extensively. Mm -hmm. And the problem about the limited number of trained GPs and family physicians, many uh, specialists focusing on specific areas. And finally, excess patient demand, thanks to free access and lack of gatekeeping. So that happened because that was deteriorated and exacerbated by COVID situation. So we have a situation that the health service is no longer sustainable and very fragile and COVID mm. just fueled uh, the problem because uh, it's massive expansion of demand. And this is the Shiozaki's uh, government reform working group and LDP. And uh, behind the scene, we helped on this agenda, uh, which was uh, finalized last July, a year ago. And this is just, to me, this is a landmark uh, recommendation because they tried to change the system to tackle the pandemic, which was 
built 120 years ago around the Meiji era. Because the current system to tackle the pandemic is, has not changed fundamentally since the Meiji era. So this proposal consisting of five it uh, six items uh, actually trying to making things upside down on the ministry and infectious disease control uh, front. So it was quite, you know, really, really shocking to many of the people working mm. at the ministry because we are saying that um, <laughs> We should integrate public health and medical care. You may not understand because in other countries, COVID, you know, tackling COVID is basically under the umbrella of medical care. So therefore, you don't have to worry about the you know shifting mild cases to medium the ill patient to severe patient. So because it's under the medical umbrella, the problem here mild cases is under the public health centers and the moderately to severe cases are under medical care. And the information systems, um, active surveillance and the medical care records are not integrated at all. So there is a total disruption between public health and the medical care. And also <laughs> that's the source of power for the ministry and the National Institute of Infectious Disease people. So, so to that, uh, this government's reform from LDP tried to uh, change the system. Mm -hmm. And they proposed, so they had an approval, a green light from the uh, party committee. And the Shiozaki presented it to the health minister and also Ministry of Health folks, a very high ranking official, including chief mm -hmm. officer. And since then, they didn't do anything. And we expected the current situation, uh, medical system collapse would happen. And if they could respond it, they could have responded this right. a year ago. Mm -hmm. We could have avoided the current situation. So let me summarize. And so we have three basic approaches to infection control. But Japan continued to rely on people's voluntary effort to disrupt the route of transmission. And now they are saying that even Japan should go for registrating lockdown. Mm. The second Japan model to COVID pandemic, not necessarily scientifically valid, but mostly anecdotal and political approach. And I present a few examples. But um, it was already reflected in this independent investigation commission um, right. chaired by Funa Hassan, and uh, they called the strategy uh, is a kind of makeshift response. <laughs> and uh, one of the high ranking officials said the makeshift response turned out to be all right. So that's the basic mindset at the beginning of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And finally, I, I, I conclude my talk by the recent <laughs> interview of Suzaki in the journal called Sentaku. And he called this COVID situation as a national disaster due to right. incompetent policy makers. So he said, you know, he's stepping down, he's retiring, he's not running anymore, but he's saying that uh, he regressed, that uh, he couldn't change the infectious disease law and the Minister of Health continues to ignore his proposal. And he was the only person who opposed to the idea to leave mild cases at home. And he thinks that uh, this is the deterioration of policy making process, even at the LDP front. And fundamentally, he thinks the reasons of this uh, incompetent response is, is primarily uh, due to the fact that uh, policy makers do not respect expert and they use the expert for their own objectives. And also uh, to him, the current governmental experts are also not necessarily, necessarily so competent. So in the end, he, uh, I, can, I can feel his regret, but also he is still uh, hoping that uh, he could support uh, you know, transforming uh, process. So I'll stop here.
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much for a very um, interesting and sobering presentation. Tremendous <laughs> number of problems and priorities to be addressed. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll turn to questions. Normally, we would take questions from the floor first, but one of our members, Pio D'Amelio, has to leave quite soon, so he's asked me if I would prioritize his two brief questions. One is to Dr. Kurokawa, and yeah. that is, uh, Dr. Kurokawa, as a former chair of a parliamentary independent investigation body, yeah. do you think mm -hmm. there are grounds now to establish a new investigation body? So that's the question to Dr. Kurokawa and to Dr. Shibuya. Um, you, as a doctor and a scholar, what could be your short and sharp message to those in Japan and abroad who are still wondering or are definitely against getting vaccinated. So, Dr. Kurokawa, first, please. What should we do? Is there yeah. a need for a new... <laughs> Sorry, so I... This, <laughs> this is a purpose of deep dive. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Yes, go ahead, please. No. Me? Deep dive, huh? Deep dive. Deep this dive, is a yes. Deep dive, right? Yes. So recently, in my speaking engagement, I start, the, I start with the, these two questions. Ah. You know, you graduate a great sort of institution, university, and get a job in Mitsubishi Bank, all right? And after 10, 15 years in Mitsubishi Bank, you become a reasonably competent banker, right? Mm -hmm. Then can he move to Sumitomo Bank? That's my question. And then oh. they, well, obviously not. And then my uh, second question is you, I uh, studied at a great institution like University of Tokyo, Kyoto University, then go to master's degree in engineering and then get the job in Hitachi. After 10 years or 15 years, you become a reasonably independent, great, competent engineer, right? Mm. Can he move to Panasonic? No, right? So that is a deep dive of things of Japanese institutions. That means if you cannot move from one institution to another, then you have to do more lobbying your boss and tend to be say yes to go up the ladder. So that's what a fundamental issue in Japanese. If you want to go up, you have to make a decision. Sometimes mm. it may fail, fail, but you learn something. Mm. And it's a reason why Japan after the end of gold cold war and internet age the economy had been sluggish that's my sort of inquiry core message you cannot move laterally as a professional yes okay. but kurokawa sensei, kurokawa sensei Hi. My, my question was uh, do you foresee for yourself uh, a new role as a chair for the Pandemic international. <laughs> in, in a way, yes. this, so, sorry, this if, I may, if I may yeah. summarize this, we, yeah. we need action, obviously. There's a lot of different opinions, there are a lot of problems. We need to act quickly. So, right. by setting up a new commission, um, would that help <laughs> or would it simply add to bureaucracy? What's the most effective way of what? tackling this problem? Yeah, I'm not so sure the same because now, after 10 years in Fukushima, do you think any significant change? <laughs> so that is the thing. The core value is you are not learning from the failure. Mm -hmm. And then transparency is a key because hyper-connected world, you just cannot hide anything. Mm -hmm. So Fukushima disaster, 10 years. Do you see any change, significant mm -hmm. change in mindset, institution, mm -hmm. how to dispose treated water? Okay. Okay. That's the key issue. Okay, Dr. Shavira, then, if you wanted to co comment on that point, too, <laughs> you would be welcome. Um, I'd yeah, like to answer the question about vaccination. Yeah. Yes, please, please. Okay, fine. Okay. Yes, yes, so my answer is yes, definitely. That's great. The answer is definitely. Yes. Right. Uh, Shibuya sensei, may I just uh, <laughs> give a, a, a touch of nationalism here? Uh, usually, Italians are proud only for football, but <laughs> Our country has now achieved the 73% of vaccination, yeah, and it's right. not on your file. Please adjourn. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. right. Uh, also, I'm very uh, proud of this. <laughs> but surprisingly, the Italian government is trying to mandate the vaccination now, yes. which is surprising too. Yes. Wow.
for school, for um, teachers. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Let, let, let's let's move on then to, uh, so uh, Pierre, are you <laughs> happy with the answer to the question? Uh, yes, yes. Good, thank, thank you. you very much. Right, questions from the room then. Um, yeah. Do we have questions from the room? Uh, uh, Joan Anderson, yes, please, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Thank you both for a very, very thought-provoking and um, excellent presentations. I'm interested to know, given what you both seem to be pretty um, lacking in optimism about the role of central government and the ability for things to change rapidly, um, do you really think that kind of this local bottom-up approach can work both in terms of um, perhaps promoting vaccinations in different ways, but also mm -hmm. in terms of testing. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a huge hunger for testing. Many people want to know their status. And I, of course, you know, in the UK, lateral flow testing yeah. is available free of charge. And right. my, my sisters test themselves before they meet each other. It's just what you do. Do you think there's any possibility of promoting testing in that kind of radical way? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think, I don't think the national government would do that because still there seems to be a hesitancy among the Ministry of Health uh, experts and, and bureaucrats. Even now for the opening up the school, I am recommending that uh, the kids should be t get tested at least once a week and ideally twice mm -hmm. a week. But what they are advocating is that, you know, if you have a symptom, stay home. If there is a case, close the school. That's totally non-scientific mm -hmm. because we need to open up the school and let the kids interact safely. And there is a way to prevent the transmission of the school. So basically mm -hmm. testing ventilation, wearing a mask, and also vaccination. But uh, they have not done that kind of approach. So I, I, so going back to your question about whether the bottom up approach will be useful to massively expand the testing, there are some good examples. For, for example, Hiroshima Prefecture, uh, Sumido Ward in Tokyo, Setagaya. When the leaders in each municipality right. are convinced, mm -hmm. they are very quick. Of course, mm -hmm. the budget matters, but uh, the fun, uh, unfortunately, there seems to be a tendency where you, where you are going to live will define your life expectancy, as in the mm -hmm. case in the UK. So unfortunately, the, the Japan is too big to manage. Uh, <laughs> so, and also, it depends on the leaders in each municipality. And we have a way to choose the good leaders. And then the next national election will be the good opportunity to show that, but I'm not quite sure what will happen to the national government given this current debate about the politics. They are not, they are, every candidate of the prime minister saying that their, their priority is COVID, but their priority is their you know, own <laughs> power. Right. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think we have a question from Dennis Normile. Uh, Dennis, are you still there? I'm here. Oh, would, Dennis. Would you like to go ahead and ask your question, please? No, right. Yes. Actually, for Dr. Shibuya. And it's <laughs> not uh, just about uh, Japan, but globally. Sorry, your question is for both doctors or what? No, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'd like to address this specifically to Dr. Shibuya because he Dr. talked Shibuya. about the okay. difficulty of herd immunity. Uh, which is um, a challenge it's now facing uh, many countries around the world, but in particular in the Asia Pacific region, you have many countries who are transitioning from a, a zero COVID approach to hoping to get their vaccination rates high enough mm -hmm. right. to open up the country. Right. Uh, as you said, herd immunity will be challenging. You probably know uh, just a month ago, there was a study published in Australia that predicted that um, with Delta, you would have to have 80 to 85% right. vaccine coverage to achieve herd immunity. Mm -hmm. It seems we're going to have to learn to live with COVID. Yes. And balance COVID much as we do 
uh, seasonal influenza. Yeah. Whereas we know there will be losses every year. We encourage people to get a vaccine, but still we don't try to stamp out seasonal influenza. Are we going to have to take a similar approach with COVID? And how are we going to balance that? How, who's going to decide how many deaths are acceptable? <laughs> what burden on the, the health system is acceptable? Mm -hmm. Who's going to make that decision? I think that's a really brilliant set of questions to be posed, not just me, but to the uh, government. And uh, my personal answer to your question, a, I think before and after vaccination became available, the situation is totally different. Before vaccination available, became available. I think I, zero COVID was the perfect approach, but now, uh, vaccination is available. The, back, the purpose of vaccination has shifted from preventing transmission to prevent your uh, death, right? So I think the vaccination is necessary, but herd immunity is very difficult. Therefore, the purpose of vaccination is to reduce the number of deaths or severe cases or hospitalization. So basically to prevent the crux of medical systems. Therefore, once the many people are vaccinated, uh, there is a very, very small probability of imposing lockdown. That's a very important thing because um, the purpose of lockdown is to prevent the crux of medical uh, system. So vaccination is very important to reduce hospitalization deaths, but also, uh, you know, disrupt the linking be between infection and hospital hospitalization deaths will change our mindset that uh, COVID is no longer a deadly uh, virulent mm -hmm. uh, fatal disease. But as you say, COVID could be a kind of flu. Uh, you know, so we don't have to worry too much about lockdown. We don't have to too much worry about stopping the economy. But uh, we may need to take some cautions, like wearing masks and ventilation. But in terms of uh, lockdown and the medical system, uh, I think the vaccination will definitely change the landscape of how to live with COVID. So we may need to live with COVID, but with vaccination, uh, there is an opportunity for mm. us to open up the economy and get the uh, economy running. So I think we have to start discussing about this issue, as you say, what's the threshold for deaths and the hospitalization? What would it look like if we were open up the economy? Or what would be the prerequisite for us to behave properly? Not just wearing mask or ventilation, but also mm -hmm. implementation of vaccine control. Sorry, my dog is barking, but uh, imp implementation of vaccine passport and uh, you know, negative test result. Particularly, I'm very worried about the Japanese um, government harsh attitude toward mm. bars <laughs> and restaurant. Right. Also, the risk is so diverse. There are good restaurants which you know um, <laughs> make sure that the ventilation is being in place, and uh, I don't think they are. They should be penalized simply because they are, you know opening up the bars and restaurants because the, we need to bring back the, the life and we need to bring back the economy and we, we need to bring back the community. So, <laughs> <laughs> What it's worth, I couldn't agree more with you. But um, I think, uh, Pia, you're pushing to ask your second question. Can you keep it fairly brief, please? Pia? I'm not, uh, I don't think I was particularly long last time. Anyway, um, I would like to ask this question to Dr. Shibuya. One thing that strike, after your explanation, things seem to be a little bit clearer, but one thing that as an Italian strikes me a lot is the fact that here in Japan, you don't do enough PCR tests. Right. We do at least uh, still now about 200, uh, 250,000 tests a day. Mm -hmm. uh, in Japan, I'm probably 20, 30,000, something like that. So, uh, and there is another thing that I would like to check with you very, very serious. I am told that if you take a private PCR test that many people do, because uh -huh. 
for their right. private reasons. In private clinics, if you end up positive, there is no GIMU, no uh, duty from the clinic to report it to whatsoever authority. Is that true? <laughs> because if this is true, it means that we may have a lot of positive people around that we are not aware of. Right. Uh, yeah, I think practically, I think doctors report to the health centers uh, and ask the patient to go to uh, get tested and uh, right. go uh, testing skiing. But uh, there are quite a few people who will not do that. Okay, mm. so for various it's reasons. possible. It is not illegal. I mean, they have a duty, no. but they, they may mm. forget. They yeah, may yeah, not forget or intentionally, intentionally but uh, there are people who get test positive, will not go to confirmation under the offshore active surveillance scheme at the health centers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question, which is on the hospital bed situation. I think uh, many people are worried about this. They're worried if they get sick, they will not be able to get admission to hospital. And yet, Dr. Shivoy, I think from what you were saying, the ratio of hospital beds to population in Japan is actually quite high. So without going into too much detail, what can be done to free up some beds or create new beds? I mean, China built a whole new hospital within 10 days. Yeah. So yeah. What, what can be done to actually improve this situation? It seems to be it's very easy. serious. It's easy. We can do it. Yeah with the current uh, set of beds. So A, for the moderately severe patient, we need to build a nightingale hospitals, you know, field the hospitals in a week or so. Uh, so Osaka Prefecture already announced that they will build. Uh, sorry, you faded a little bit again. Could you speak? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so in Osaka Prefecture, they yeah. announced that they are going to build a thousand bed uh, field hospital in one of the big gymnasium, so which is easy for the moderate patient because you need uh, oxygen sub compressor monitors and uh, there to be few nurses, that's it. But for the severe patient, we need really, we need hospital beds, but that's also easy because there are vacant beds at the national hospital organization and mm. Dr. Omi's uh, Japan Community Hospital Organization. And we are campaigning using media that uh, they should open up beds. Mm. And they are obliged to open up the beds because they are set up. At the time of the public health emergency, they need to serve that purpose. So right. without changing any registration, they are obliged to open up the beds, but they haven't done that. But that's also the, the point which Dr. Omi doesn't want to listen. I see. But just to follow that very quickly, are there enough nurses and medical staff doctors to... Oh, yeah, that's uh, always an excuse. You know, we have so many people and there are also so many nurses in the community who are not working, but who are willing to do volunteers, who are willing to do that kind of work, of course, paid. But first ask these people and hire these, you know, voluntary or paid uh, nurses, and then if there are no, not so many, they can make a claim. But without making any effort, this is just an excuse. Really, that's very interesting. Thank you. Hmm. Um, okay, any more questions from the few? Yes, uh, Rocky, yes. Please go to the microphone, identify yourself. Thank you very much, Rocky Swift with Reuters. Um, Dr. Shibuya, you opened your talk by talking by um, recounting some uh, general rules for fighting uh, a pandemic mm -hmm. or infection, like uh, mm -hmm. testing and uh, the three C's, isolation, vaccination. With this extended pandemic, do you think some new rules will be written, uh, particularly, you know, touching on psychology and public behavior? Because, mm -hmm. for example, as we've seen, these states of emergency have had diminishing effect over time. So for, for actually for both of you, uh, Dr. Kurokawa and Dr. Shibuya, yeah. could, could you reflect on that? Thank you. 
This is exactly my point. I think if there's some needs in legislation, you have to do it. And that's the responsibility of uh, parliamentarian sort of parliamentarians. I may just, uh, you know, just asking some uh, government to raise certain suggestions, but decision has to be made by the, this is the principle of uh, democracy. So I really pushing you guys, the elected officials have to make a decision. Mm. That's my, that's my argument. Do you know, have we learned anything from Fukushima? Yeah. Mm. They have we learned from this corona again, the same response, unless, you know, just, that would just, uh, Jeff really wrote about it. The same keyword is appearing again, because both radioactivity and virus are not visible. When something happens, you know, like failed building or this and that, they could respond very quickly. But when something happens with invisible thing, radioactivity and virus, some of the response was sluggish and similar. That's my argument. Mm. I, I like to fully echo what Dr. Koga mentioned because the issue about, uh, you know, my, I presented at the beginning of my presentation, yeah. uh, three approaches, but just to tackle virus. But this is the national security and the social right. economic agenda. The issue is becoming more on the economy and the society. So, Rocky, you're absolutely right. So it is time for us to reflect on what we have done and what we have learned. But I'm very pessimistic about the prospect, as Dr. Pokroka mentioned, because once we, you know, things will be uh, stabilized in after a few years from now, people just mm -hmm. forget. People just forget as if nothing took place. So unless we document, investigate what went wrong and what worked, and what will be the future prospect as he did for Fukushima, uh, we would just forget. But even if we do it, if we did it, and um, people would forget. So it's better to do it now rather than- Right, mm -hmm. yeah. I was really pushing PCR, testing, testing, testing. Mm -hmm. Ah. But they responded to sort of a Gyose cancer. That means I don't know why this is. You have to call the. Uh, yeah, the Gyose, Gyose yeah. cancer in, is under the infectious disease law. And right. it's mandatory for the public health. But yeah. they focus on symptomatic and <laughs> you know, cross contact. But we know that the problem is asymptomatic and airborne transmission. Right. So this Gyose cancer is no longer useful. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, um, former Foreign Minister Kishida has uh, su suggested yesterday that we should, or Japan should tighten up on its PCR, improve yeah. the PCR. So you would agree with that, presumably? Right. We would, but uh, why he didn't do it earlier? <laughs> well, yes, it's a, um, I mean, we do seem to have, a, I won't call it exactly a, a philosophy of despair, but it does, you know, has to have things changed from Fukushima, the situation is what it is. I mean, both of you, if I may ask you both, if you were in positions of ultimate power tomorrow, as from tomorrow or today, mm -hmm. what would be your priorities, Dr. Kurokawa and then Dr. Sh what would you do as an absolute priority to, to try to improve the overall situation? I think one, one thing I'm, I'm suggesting is any committee, government committee, has to be transparent and open to the public. Yeah. So I think there's many different opinions, but somebody, you know, just have to make a decision. So they, they understand the pro process of making certain decision in any government committee. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, I agree. Uh, in terms of, for example, I'll give you an example about my experience in Soma City in terms of vaccination. The fundamental driving force behind this very high coverage is that people's, people are convinced that the vaccines are safe and effective mm -hmm. because we showed all the adverse event in detail. We didn't hide anything. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so we send all the document, we right. the website, when we invite the young kids and school kids for vaccination, we shared all the information about advocacy events right. which we experienced. So that gave the, the idea about our transparency and also the extent of advocacy events. 
Uh, so, so that unless the people are convinced and feel secure, they continue to be complaining and they will continue to be <laughs> uncorroborative. So I think transparency and effective communication about right. the priority will be the key. Right. Okay. Um, I, I think we have one more question coming in here. Um, question from Milton Issa. Mm. Um, in, in case of getting a booster shot, is mm -hmm. it feasible to mix the companies vaccine, of the vaccines, for example, <laughs> Pfizer to Moderna or vice versa? <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I respond. So ministry has not yet you know, discussed on this, even though Minister Kohn is advocating. At SOMA, we have decided to go for the third shot. Uh, but uh, my personal view is that we should make the best use of available vaccines. Therefore, mixing different vaccines will be one approach, and using half of the standard dose will be the another approach. I see. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, Joan, you have another question, please. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about young people and their situation, which is obviously you know, very difficult at the moment because they haven't been vaccinated generally and they're really not only fed up but sort of depressed um, <laughs> and, and suffering mental health impacts of this mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, do you have any, what would be your message and um, approach in terms of communication to young people? And also I have a question, whether your experience in SOMA is being documented for the media because it sounds so important. Uh, in terms of documentation, it's still in Japanese, and uh, there are a bunch of documentation on our website. And secondly, in terms of young kids, young people, I think the important thing is to give them a hope about the future. So, so for example, in, in some countries, um, you know, once you get vaccinated, you are allowed to go to festival, concert, bars, that kind of a social incentive, not just the money, monetary incentive will be probably useful, mm -hmm. although some people may oppose it, but uh, at SOMA, we are, we are talking about this kind of import, the importance of the social incentives. You know, right now, because of the vaccine shortage, young kids are you know, striving for get vaccinated, getting vaccinated, but um, unless we give them vaccination right now, there will be a tendency of wary and hesitancy. That is my biggest concern. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to start discussing social incentive and how to give them hope, a prospect about the future. Right. Yeah. Um, one final question from me, if I may, and that is on the nature of the pandemic itself. I mean, will it go away? Will it die? Will it continue mutating into more and more horrible things? Um, is it man-made or is it is it natural? And finally, is there much truth in the fact that, you know, because of development is taking place on such a huge scale now, we are infringing upon nature's territory, as it were, and therefore the danger of us contracting pandemics is rising exponentially. <laughs> uh, either doctor, both of you, please. <laughs> For the big well, I'm not, I yeah, I'm, the I'm not, yeah, just why don't you, Kenji, Kenji, respond to this? Yeah, of course. So that's the reason why we need to reflect on what we are you know, facing right now and prepare for the next. But in terms yeah. of man-made or you know, laboratory-made, there seems to be a um, kind of conclusion from the uh, US front or some of the scientific uh, uh, people that mm -hmm. is obviously uh, naturally uh, about a bias, although there seems to be some conspiracy theory behind that. Uh, but. Uh, this situation will continue. Sorry, a little louder, please. Are you fading? Oh, sorry. This situation will continue for a while. Yeah. So we need to live with it. Yeah. Okay. Doctor. Right. Yeah. I, I think my argument in anything is just in this hyper connected world, transparency yeah. is a foundation of trust. Yeah. That is the thing. Right? Okay. Transparency is a foundation of 
trust, even corporate, whatever have you. You know, Toshiba is the same thing again. Governance of corporate is the same again. How about universities? I just wrote a sort of a bit longer one a few days ago about the output of science research. Japan is number nine or 10 in these days. That's crazy. Why is it? So that's uh, my, I wrote an, in Asahi or Nikkei, I think in Asahi, a few days ago. Mm. Quite wrong one. So I, I'm translating this into English too. So greater transparency leads it, to more effective treatment or more effective policies, right? Right. For the <laughs> yeah. long run, I think that is a very important element in this connected world. Yes, yes, very good point. All right, any more questions before we... Uh, I think we're coming up to 10 o'clock. Um, <laughs> yes, we are actually. So, well, no more questions? No, fine. Well, again, you know, very sincerely, thank you to you both for coming along and giving us your expertise um, this very important time. Um, it's our custom here to give one year honorary memberships to our guest speakers, which you will be receiving in due course. And as the pandemic eases, please come and make use of them and join us uh, socially or professionally. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you, thank everyone, and thank you very much indeed, Drs. Kurokawa and Shibuya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kenji, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs>